Seiko. I'm sure for most of you they won't need much introduction. They're an absolute titan in modern watchmaking. Even if you're not that interested in watches, you simply find yourself on my channel after going down some late night YouTube rabbit hole. If you've ever walked down a high street and looked into a jeweler's store window, you'll be familiar with their work. They're available in all price ranges, from the very high-end Grand Seikos all the way down to the Seiko 5 and below, can be had for a reasonable amount of money. I'm sure you've all come across them. But maybe not one quite like this. This is a 1950s Seiko Unique, and I'm going to do something that's kind of fallen out of fashion these days. Rather than chuck it in the bin and buy another one, I'm going to completely disassemble it, clean it, service it, and do a little bit of restoration to get this thing back to life. Now, this watch came as a big shock to me because this is my first Seiko, so Seiko collectors, feel free to grab your torch and pitchfork. But when I opened it up, I was sure I had worked on this movement before. This is very, very similar to a ETA 1080. That would be a Swiss watch that was ubiquitous in the 50s, built in everything. There it was in a Breitling. Here it is in a Braun and Mercia. It was everywhere and provided the architecture for center seconds watches in a large case for the next 10 years or so. Now, as we go through the disassembly and cleaning, I'm going to go through the history of Seiko. But I'd just like to give those of you not in the know a sense of scale. Here's a screw from this watch and there's the head of a needle. So I truly hope that gives you a sense of the scale that we actually work at that I don't think you can get just from looking into a display case back. For me, when I first opened this watch, it felt like somebody had just nicked all my sweeties. How did a company that's known nowadays for its innovation end up with what looks suspiciously like an ETA research sample that fell off the back of a truck in downtown Tokyo? So I'm going to try and answer that and more questions about Seiko as we go through the process of restoring this timepiece. Now, if you're the sort of person that's not so interested in watch history and you just really want to see the nuts and bolts of the watch, no problem. If you skip to the reassembly portion of the video, I'll be covering that in great detail. Now, I'm going to start this watch disassembly by removing the balance cock here and the balance. I'm then going to disassemble the train of wheels bridge, the barrel bridge, the train of wheels and everything on this side of the watch in the background of the video while we discuss a little bit about Seiko, their history and how they ended up with this copy my homework piece we see in front of us right here. Seiko's journey starts in 1881 when a 20-year-old Kintaro Hattori opened a shop repairing and selling watches in central Tokyo. Eleven years later, he actually opened his own factory. Now, you might have noticed that this watch says Seiko Sha, as you can see there, rather than just Seiko. And this was basically Japanese for House of Precision. So it's kind of a cool name for a watchmaking factory, in my opinion. A lot of the early Seikos were actually branded Seiko Sha. So in 1913, they created their first wristwatch. In 1924, they actually released the first watch that was branded officially Seiko. So these early years for Seiko weren't without their problems, however. In 1923, a large earthquake hit Tokyo, completely destroying the Seiko Sha factory. Now, it was actually burnt to a crisp as well afterwards in the fires caused by the earthquake. But it's at this point in my research into Seiko that I really began to like Kintaro Hattori. Now, he offered free replacement watches to all of his customers that were damaged or let's face it, completely burnt to a crisp in that fire. He took out a large newspaper advert letting everybody know that he would replace those watches free of charge. And this really gained Seiko a lot of trust with the people of Japan. They thought this was a nice gesture. I did too. Um, top marks for Seiko on this one. Now I'm just removing the last screws here from the barrel bridge. I've taken the screws out of the train of wheels bridge and now the train bridge is coming out. And I have to say this bridge is a chonkosaurus. It is absolutely massive, a true thick boy right here. So the barrel bridge is the same as this comes off. It's huge. The pins locking it into place are very long, much longer than you would find on a 1080. So that's one difference right there. I'm not sure if they had manufacturing issues, why it was this, this chonky. 
Uh, it's definitely a little clunky and not at all nice to get off the watch. So my first question I had about this, just from a purely mechanical and a technical point of view, was did the Japanese make any improvements to the 1080? And I have to say, no. Uh, now, I am a watch collector predominantly that's turning slowly but surely into a watchmaker here on my YouTube journey, uh, sharing that with you guys, hopefully getting some helpful comments along the way, which I have had many of, so I take this opportunity to thank you all for that. So don't take my word for this. I am definitely not FP Jean out here, but I've worked on quite a few 1080s, and this one, or this clone-ish of one, is definitely the clunkiest I have worked on. It's also a mistake for me here. I meant to loosen this screw. You don't want to take this out. You can see it popping up and down. It's sprung from the other side. And if you take it out completely, that's going to happen to you. And I refer you back to my sense of scale. This was a lot of fun to crawl around the floor and find. So we're actually on the dial side of the watch now. This is where the keyless and motion works live. So we'll need to get those all out of the watch and ready for cleaning. But we still do have quite a bit to cover about Seiko's early history and how they ended up with this movement. So if we were to flash forward to Seiko in their 30s and 40s, they were basically selling rebranded Swiss Maurice 10 movements. Now, this is not a disparagement on Seiko. Selling rebranded movements or Ibush movements that came 90% complete from a factory was very common practice. At the beginning of this video, you saw a Braun and Mercier and a Breitling, both very expensive, very exclusive brands that were doing the same thing with ETAs. The Japanese simply did the same thing with Morris. Now, there are a couple of things that make these mechanical watches expensive in the modern day. A big one is brand. Uh, so even if you know little about watches, you might want a Rolex simply because it's a Rolex. And the other one is the level of finish that's put into the watch. So it was very common to buy one of these Ebush movements from a manufacturer and then give it a much higher level of finish than average. This would basically designate the price. So even today in the modern world, you can put two manufacturers using ETAs together and one will be substantially more expensive because of that twofold combination of the brand and the level of fit and finish on that movement, on the dial, on the hands, and so on and so forth. So as we come to the end of the disassembly here, I'm going to take you through uh, some of the ultrasonic cleaning process because I've made some modifications to that. But first, I'd like to ask the audience, if you like, a question. This watch here has the number seven on it, and I haven't been able to, in my research, find out why. Now, I'm sure a lot of my core audience here are more knowledgeable about Seiko than I am. So if somebody could let me know what this number seven is, because I highly doubt it's the serial number, um, I'd be very grateful. Now, we come to the final disassembly where the barrel complete has to be disassembled. This has the mainspring in that houses all the power for the watch. So I'm just going to stick a pair of tweezers on the top of that so it doesn't ping out like a rocket. And I have to say, this is another awkward thing. This barrel is extremely deep, which makes getting the spring out a pain, uh, more painful than it normally is. I also have the feeling that this spring, maybe because of the barrel design, or maybe it's just old and the last guy that was in here uh, made a few mistakes, but it, it should be flat. So I'm going to do some adjustments on this now. I'll end up replacing this spring way after this video comes out because it's so old, it probably needs a replacement. And these are, in my opinion, one of the parts on a mechanical watch that can be replaced. It's a consumable. So I'm just bending this into position as best as I can. This is just practice for me more than anything else. And we're going to get it flat-ish. Now I'm going to put some more work on this, but it's certainly better than it was when we started. It still needs a little bit of tweaking. I won't make you sit through that. 
So here's a look at all the parts that we removed from the watch on my watch parts tray. Now I want to cover what I've done to my ultrasonic cleaner. So I'm going to get the parts in cleaning baskets and I won't make you sit through the whole thing. Here's a look at the parts for those of you that might be interested. And the balance complete and the balance cock are going to go back in the watch to protect them during the cleaning process. Now the new way I'm doing my ultrasonic cleaning is to basically use a beaker, one of those you would use in science class, because it has much thinner walls than a standard jam jar or mason jar. Now the reason for this is I think the ultrasonic waves will pass through thinner glass better and give me more effective cleaning. So to pull this off I had to make a new lid for my ultrasonic cleaner which I'll show you in a second and a lip around my beaker, a little holder around my beaker so it doesn't touch the bottom of the ultrasonic cleaner and this allows me I believe to get a much better better clean, although I haven't tested it out enough, so I'll follow up with that in the long run. Now I'm going to go ahead as soon as everyone seemed to enjoy it in the last video and make a strap for this watch. I believe that not enough attention is paid to the straps, especially in videos like this. It's a very large component of the watch. It makes or breaks the look of a watch in my opinion. So in this one we'll be using ostrich leg. Now I really like ostrich leg. It's a pain to work with but you can get so many different looks with it depending on where you cut the skin. I use templates to kind of organize the look in my head to get exactly what I want. Now in the last video I used the cheapest tools humanly possible. Um, I think I paid $20 for the lot. In this video I'm going to step it up a notch although not completely to 100%. I still want this to be feasible for you to go out and buy this stuff so you can make your own straps. Now I'll be using Olva knives in this. They are much more expensive than their counterpart so they're around $10 for the breakaway knife and around $20 for this scalpel here. However, I feel like that's a reasonable price. The blades on these things are superb. The quality is superb. It's stainless steel rather than standard bent aluminium. And I would definitely recommend their official blades. And I'll show you why later. You're going to need some sort of skiving knife. I normally use this one. In the last video, we used this one, which I said cost about 10 bucks. But it seems like I've made a drastic overestimation of the price because here it's $3 including delivery. Now this thing out of the box is about as straight as a barroom pool cue. And here is a very dejected me wondering just how it's possible to make something this bad in 2023. I believe that Chinese right in there probably says buy one, get one free. If it doesn't, even for $3, it probably should do. Now, I just can't leave this thing alone. I kind of hate useless tools and there is steel in this. So let's see what we can do with it. Now, here's the reason it won't cut and why last time I looked like I was making snow in the previous video. I'm not sure I ordered the serrated one. This is terrible. Of course, as luck would have it, I flipped on my bench grinder to make this video and it released the magic blue smoke that makes all electronics work. Or who knows, maybe I turned it upside down and all the electrons fell out. I'm using this Dremel tool just for material removal. Definitely would not recommend this. Looks like a dog's breakfast, which is going to give me a lot more work to do on these here sharpening stones. So this one's more grinding. It's about a 240 grit. And I'll work my way through lots of grits here to get a decent edge on this thing. Now, I'm not sure whether I'd recommend people actually buy one of these $3 knives and go all these trouble. Um, I can't really tell you I'm not your mum. But if you fancy an hour in the workshop and you happen to have one of these and you're not the sort of person that just likes to throw stuff in the bin that could otherwise be perfectly usable, then yeah, sure, I had quite a bit of fun uh, fixing this thing up. And like I say, it won't be my primary knife, but it definitely does the job. So after all of this sharpening and grinding, I've got a double bevel on the blade, uh, one that makes it nice and flat so it doesn't push the leather up in the air, and one that actually cuts. Now, here's a before and after under the microscope. Uh, we're slightly better on the after shot. I won't even bother to point out which one's which, I think. You can probably see it. And let's see how this thing cuts. 
uh, like butter. I actually ended up making a huge line in my cutting mat here because I drastically underestimated how sharp this thing is. Now, it's not the best knife in the world. It is almost certainly stainless steel. Actually, it is. I tested it. So this stainless can't be hardened, so it will go blunt faster than an actual proper carbon steel knife. But it does the job, as you can see. Three dollars, uh, kind of marvellous, really, what you can buy nowadays. Um, in fact, so cheap, I'm not sure it should be for sale at that price. But it definitely does the job. Here would be where your spring bar went through, nice and thin, uh, Marvellous, really. So we are done with that. I actually went ahead and made a handle for this thing, but I'm not going to show the process in the video. If you're really interested, let me know. Um, and there's the handle. It's just out of a piece of hickory. Uh, I might bang it in the next video. We could do a continuing series on upgrading the trash nugget knife. So it comes to cutting the leather now. And this leather is a pain to cut through. This blade, however, makes quite short work of it. If I'd used the hardware store variant, the either $1 snap-off knife I used in the last video, I am sure this would be much more awkward. And we are sort of keeping some continuity here because Olva is a Japanese brand. This is a Japanese knife. Works quite nicely, I think, on a Japanese watch video. Now, this knife was $15. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. Uh, it's expensive in comparison to a standard stap on knife, and I'm not sponsored by Olva. Uh, it's just genuinely a recommendation. For the backing of this watch, I'm going to use lambskin. So I've picked two materials that are completely different and very difficult to work with. So if you're making your first strap, I would recommend you follow. You can follow this process, of course, uh, but I would recommend that you start with standard leather. Uh, both ostrich leg and lambskin are difficult to work with. Lambskin being a bit like a rubber band, um, we're going to have to introduce a new material in this video because of that. But you can see here, if you don't have a very, very sharp knife for lambskin, it's just going to stretch out as you try and scribe it. Uh, it genuinely is a pain. It's very difficult to get a nice flat uh, cut at the end. So I'm going to thin out both ends of the leather so they can be stuck together. I use a fairly non-traditional construction method with my straps. So the first video on the Gruen, which we made a strap for, is an easier construction method. I'm going to kick it up a notch in this video, and I'm going to keep doing that. If people are enjoying this series as we go through the strap making process the next time and the next time, I'm going to keep introducing more tools and more difficult techniques. So you can start with me in the first video and make the easiest type of strap and follow along. I think that's kind of a nice way to get into watchmaking. Watchmaking itself, i.e. the actual fixing and servicing of watches, the restoration of watches, is a fairly difficult, expensive hobby to get into. Now, I do recommend it, but there will be a steep learning curve. And starting with straps is the way I started. And I just think it's a nice way to do something with a watch. Now, as we're using lambskin here, one of the more difficult materials to work with, it will be very stretchy. So I'm going to introduce a new material, Veladon. This is the stuff that Hermes uses in all their high-end leather work. It's quite expensive. Uh, it is worth the money, though, if you are dealing with very thin and stretchy leather. This material will not stretch at all. It's like a very dense weave. So somewhat akin to Kevlar, although definitely this is not a recommendation for making homemade body armor. Now, I buy my Veladon from Singapore, which is where a lot of high-end goods come from, especially for the fashion industry. And the reason I do this is because this stuff is faked on the internet all the time. It looks like a piece of paper. And I have, in fact, been sold a piece of paper a couple of times, which was very nice. So I'm going to recommend the place I buy it, uh, as I said, in Singapore. So the shipping is kind of expensive, although they do get it to you very quickly. It was three days from Singapore to my door here in the Czech Republic. This is not an affiliation or an advertisement in any way. It's just where I've managed to find it and it's on the up and up. The guy that runs the store is very nice. So I will link our leather supply down in the description below if you want to go and buy some of this stuff. 
Now, as we go onto the construction of this strap or through the construction of this strap, I also want to point out that I use a very, very low tech glue. So my straps are easy to pull apart before they are sewn. Now, there is a method to my madness here. I am a large advocate in everything I do being repairable. So the top leather on this strap will last for a very long time. It will last for years. And in fact, most leather will, if you're using a nice, good quality vegetable tan leather, it will patina over time and the strap will actually begin to look nicer. However, the stitching will fail and the backing leather will almost always fail before the front. And I construct my straps in such a way that they can be pulled apart. So if somebody sends one back to me, I can rip off the backing leather and replace it. I want my straps to be repairable. I use extremely high quality, high end materials. And the thought of just throwing that in the bin after a year or two because the backing has started to go, is just not something that I am interested in building. So the low-tech glue makes the strap more difficult to construct, though. It's easier with a kind of more traditional glue that would bond the strap, like weld it together. But for me, the extra time and effort it takes to get a repairable strap is well worth the invested time. Your mileage might vary on that. This is just a personal thing for me. I only want to be involved in the creation of things that are repairable. It's partly an environmental thing, although that's not really my area of interest as a maker. I want to make something that lasts. I am not a fan of a disposable throwaway culture that we find ourselves in, uh, a disposable throwaway world, I guess you could say. So... A little bit more effort on my part leads to a strap that can be sent back to me or if you're making your own, can be repaired yourself. Um, it's well worth the extra time and effort. So I'm going to use a template to cut round this now stuck together strap. And I like to make a couple of little cuts at the top. So when I do this long cut here, I don't come up to the top and bend the leather. Now, this isn't always necessary. I like to do it on leather that will stretch a lot. Just gives me that extra bit of security that if I'm cutting, in this case, an 18 millimeter strap for the Seiko, it's going to be 18 millimeters by the time I finish it. Now, I'm going to cut the bottom round of this strap. And I'm going to mark the back of the leather because ostrich leg is hard to mark. It's hard to see what you're doing. So make some rough cuts and then make some adjusted cuts around the outside to get a nice smooth curve. You can try and make this cut in one go. I've seen some people that just cut all the way around in kind of one continuous motion. This, in my experience, is rather difficult, especially when dealing with more exotic skins that have kind of bumps and pits on them. Your knife will hit that and sort of wobble about, and you'll end up with an uneven curve. As you can see, this way is a little bit more of a pain. It takes a lot more practice and a lot more skill, but you come out with something in the end that's a nice, smooth round. Now, you'll need to do a little bit of sanding and you'll need to also figure out which way up your strap is going, um, which way you like. On an exotic pattern, on normal leather, it should make that much difference to you. Uh, but if you're dealing with an exotic skin, obviously the orientation of that pattern becomes of paramount importance. So I'm going to cut the back end of the strap here. This is where the buckle or deployant clasp would go. And as you can see, our basic strap, what we've got so far, is straight and it should be the right size. Now, it's going to need a little bit of sanding just because you're never going to get that perfect cut unless you are stamping this out. So I see a lot of things these days that say handmade and really they aren't. They're cut with laser cutters and, and basically the handmade part comes with just the glue. I don't like that. When I see handmade, I don't want the thing handmade. I want it hand cut, hand stitched. That's handmade to me. Stitched on a machine, uh, you know, pressed together by a machine, cut by a machine, and then packed into a box by a human and called handmade with a large price tag on it. If not, I think, very honest. Unfortunately, the law leaves a very broad definition of the term handmade. Um, 
kind of gets on my nerves. Right, anyhow, that's enough ranting from me. Now I'm going to put a bit of edge paint on this before the stitching. And the reason for this is just for sanding. So I like to make sure I've got no high spots or low spots or anything like this. You can skip this step if you want. This is just me um, trying to get the best edge it's possible to get. And you'll see in this shot as I mark the leather for the stitching, 99% of that edge paint is gone where I've sanded it back at various different grits. I think about 400 is the highest I would go because you still want somewhat of a rough edge for the final edge paint to stick to. Now it's difficult to mark ostrich skin as I said, so take your time on this bit or at least I do because one stitch hole in the wrong place here and you're going to end up throwing this in the bin and this is not the cheapest stuff to one in your dustbin. So I have a couple of holes in my template. You can just print this out on a piece of paper. Really not that much difference to it. Uh, I have a 3D printer, so, you know, have 3D printer, will print. Uh, I'm going to mark the holes first. So a lot of people will just hammer the holes straight through. I've done it myself. Uh, just go down the line. With exotic skin, I like to mark first just to make sure I have those holes in exactly the correct position. Now, here again is where my construction method differs a little bit to standard straps you might have seen made. Mine is more complicated for the simple reason that I want to stitch the bottom strap keeper by the buckle into the watch. Normally, it's just glued. Uh, and then the leather is glued over the top, and that's what holds the strap keeper in. But in my experience, it can be one of the first points of failure on a watch, and I want to put an actual stitch through mine. So for this video, I'll be using the cheap punch. You can buy a set of these for about $10. In the next video, I am going to use French punches. The reason I'm not using them here is they cost about between $100 and $200 for a set of French punches. So we're going to do this again with the most basic of equipment, um, just so it's easier to follow along. I will be stepping that up and introducing electronic edge creases and all sorts of fancy things. But there you can see the holes for our strap. And because of the time and trouble we took with the pre-marking, it's nice and straight and all perfectly aligned, which is exactly what you want to see. Now I'm going to hand over to Mrs. Saving Time here for the sewing of the strap. And the string you use for straps can be extremely important. I didn't get into this one in the last one, but I'm going to use a Wexin handmade thread here. It's a very high quality polyester. I would normally use linen. And again, one of the reasons why my construction method is a little different is so I never have to burn any string. And I'll show you how we achieve that so you don't get those kind of nasty burn polyester bobbles. So Mrs. Saving Time here is going to do the stitching for us. She is in real life a historian of science and ideas, so an academic basically. So I'm going to bring you a world first on this video, an academic doing some honest work. We both start and finish our straps with a double back stitch. This is just for security, but also we will actually exit the string out of the side of the strap so it can be pushed back in and not burn or tied off. This gives you a much neater look and it's part of the reason why I finish the edges after the sewing. The other reason being the sewing compresses the leather and it's genuinely easier. So you can see our string exit in the side of the strap, just cut it off close to the side and that can be pushed back in with a little bit of super glue and then sanded and then your edge can be finished on the top, which is what I'm going to do right here. Now you'll notice that on the bottom of our strap, there is no strap keeper yet. And this is because if you put the strap keeper in first, you wouldn't be able to finish the edges properly. So the strap comes out half sewn, the strap keeper is then put in and the sewing is finished. This both allows for proper edge finishing uh, in the nicest manner and it also allows you to stitch straight through that strap keeper. This is much, much more of a pain in the backside, however, so bear that in mind. Now, the edge is almost finished here. It's nice and flat and dull. And if you want to make that nice and shiny, a good trick is isopropyl alcohol. 
So isopropyl will actually melt the edge paint slightly and take a little bit off, but it will give you a nice shine to your edges, flatten out any bumps. What you don't want to see with edge paint is a double layer of leather. That's what you're trying to cover up. So we got it pretty good here. It's um, acceptable, I would say, definitely not the best I'd ever done because I would normally use an electronic edge creaser to crease the edges first and that will compress the leather a bit. But I'm going to leave that off this video. So just for demonstration purposes, here is an Alpha knife with a standard hardware store blade in it. As you can see, I am genuinely on the struggle bus. As I mentioned, this leather can be tough as old boot leather, the ostrich, not all of it. Uh, this piece in particular is, is rock solid. Uh, so just as a demonstrator, there is a standard hardware store blade in that knife. And here is an Alpha knife with one of their own blades, as you can see. Uh, well, I think the results speak for themselves on this one. And again, I'm not sponsored by these people. I have no affiliate links. Um, the only reason for the recommendation is I think price to performance ratio is excellent. So scribe the um, strap keeper end here. This will be stuck into the watch and then we will continue on with the sewing. I'm not going to actually stick both ends of the bottom strap keeper in because that would make it more difficult to sew, as you will see after we get started with that. As I pull the bottom of this strap apart, there isn't actually any glue on this part. I didn't put any. What's keeping this together at the moment is mainly the edge paint. So just the friction of the edge paint holding that together. You can then pull the bottom of the strap up, stick your strap keeper in, get the fit and fitment right. You want the right size. You want a nice tight strap keeper. I hate um, sort of badly made straps where the strap, the end of the strap tail flaps around in the breeze, just a pet peeve. And you also want to take the effort to finish your strap keeper with some edge paint. Um, you don't have to. I'm going to use the French method here, uh, which is just applying the paint with a needle or a owl as opposed to a roller. It doesn't really matter. These thin bits, I find a needle is just fine. And then finally, the glue up into the bottom of the strap. And I can hand you back over to Mrs. Saving Time for the rest of the stitching, which it shouldn't be too much now, just the bottom of this have to make sure we get that stitch through the strap keeper to doubly secure it into the watch. As I mentioned, I am predominantly interested in building stuff that lasts. I have no interest in making disposable uh, items or, you know, with leather, it's always going to wear. Uh, it's going to last for years and years and years, but ultimately it will be disposable. So my goal is to give the material the lifespan that it deserves. So get one stitch through the strap keeper just to secure that in. And then we're going to go back through the lambskin. And the reason for this is so we don't have to end the sewing here. We can go back through that lambskin, one back stitch through the strap keeper, take both of the strings behind underneath the lambskin, and then continue sewing. This gives us one continuous piece of string down the left and right hand sides of the strap without having to do any extra gluing or any extra burning of that string. It's a secure method of holding it. Just It's just a nice finish. It's what you pay for in watchmaking is those little touches, you know, that most people would notice. But if you're in the know, if you're in that mindset of having things done to the best that they can be done, then those little touches are going to be important to you. So you can see where our spring bars would go through nice and round, uh, perfectly round in fact. And I use a hot bar, but you can heat up the tip of an owl to just push that through to get that nice and round looking. And to finish off this strap, I'm going to use beeswax. Um, this is a combination of beeswax and certain oils. This is my own kind of blend which I'll be happy to cover in the next video if, if anyone really wants to know. It's not a complicated mixture. I like to use more natural finishes on my straps where it's appropriate. Now, for all those people that voted in the poll between ostrich and snakeskin, I went ahead and made the snakeskin as well. It's actually going to someone in Switzerland along with another strap. And here it is for you that wanted to see the snakeskin. Sorry, the ostrich leg won out, but here's a look at that. So I think all of these straps came out wonderfully, but it's time now to get back to our Seiko to finish the service and get it working. Now, before I put these back together, when they come out of the cleaner, 
I like to take a look at everything under a microscope. So our jewels here being lovely and clean, our wheels without dints or gouges or snapped teeth, just to double check. Now, I'm not going to make you, through, you sit through too much of that, but a microscope is very handy for part inspection, especially after cleaning. As we go ahead and get this thing back together, I'm going to start by oiling the barrel here and putting the spring back in. So the spring will need to be wound into some form of winder that's the correct size, and then it can be pushed back into the barrel. Now there'll be some oiling on show here. I'm not going to show every step of that as this video is already quite lengthy. And I want to cover briefly how we ended up with this kind of clone Swiss movement in this Seiko. So we left Seiko in the 1940s where they were actually buying movements from the Swiss, from Maurice, and converting them for use in their own watches, which as I mentioned was a common practice at the time. Now, the cliff nose version of what happened after this was the Second World War. So before the Second World War, the Japanese yen that was about 3.6 yen to the dollar. And in 1949, there was 360 yen to the dollar. So even if the Japanese had wanted to continue buying Swiss movements to modify, it would have been extremely cost prohibitive. So that's how we end up with this cloned movement. It's just economics and the circumstance of the time. Now, this was a very important movement for Seiko because it seems Genzo Hattori, the son of the founder Kintero Hattori, really didn't like this practice. So in the early 1950s, he took their Dani and Sua factories and set them in direct competition against each other. Now, the history of Seiko is quite complicated, so I'm giving you really the Cliff Notes version. But basically what Genzo did is he made both factories compete. He forbid them from using uh, the same watch parts, from sharing designs. Now, the Dani factory were the people responsible for King Seiko, which I'm sure most of you have saw, have seen, and Sua for Grand Seiko. So this was really the start of Seiko going their own way, and they did this um, on the orders of Genzo because I don't believe that he was happy with simply being a cloner or even a finisher of Swiss movements. This really kicked Seiko into being the true innovator it is today in the watchmaking world. This movement to me is a fantastic example of a company being forced into something by a set of circumstances and taking that and deciding that they were going to do a lot, lot better. I mean, Seiko basically went from the 1940s where they were using bought uh, Swiss movements to the 1950s where they were copying Swiss movements right up until 1969 when they came out with the first quartz watch and almost decimated the entire Swiss watch industry. So they went from being at the back of the pack, in my opinion, uh, a lot of stuff that, you know, wasn't that impressive to in a few short years absolutely leading some of the technology in watchmaking, which they still do with things like their Seiko Spring Drive and various other innovations today. So I'm going to get back to the nuts and bolts of the watch now. So the train of wheels has gone in and the train of wheels bridge is going on the top. Now I have to say that this train of wheels bridge, because it's so chonky, and those pins were so long, this is the worst train of reels bridge I have ever had to fit. I had to stop twice during this process to go and take a bit of a walk to stop me just hitting the thing with a hammer. I have honestly never experienced a bridge that awkward to fit, and it should have been simple. So I've gone from pretty much singing Seiko's braces there to saying this thing, it's not great. Now, here you can see the pivots from those wheels coming through the top of the bridge, which you need to confirm before you screw it down, or at least I like to. I've had bent pivots before. Like I said, I'm not FP Jean, so I take a few steps that um, just to double check everything, just to make sure I've got it right. So, of course, saying just to make sure I've got it right is when it goes wrong, so I forgot to fit the set lever screw before the barrel bridge went on. No harm done. The barrel bridge in this watch was 
quite easy to fit. If that had been the train bridge I had to refit, I might have just thrown out the rattle from the pram and there might not be a video. But as you can see, it all goes back together. Very common mistake from me forgetting to put that set lever screw back in. But again, no harm done. So everything's getting screwed down now. What I like to do is hold the bridges with a piece of pegwood. I actually got some plastic component probes now on viewer recommendation, just because the pegwood, there's a chance it can leave little microfibers and stuff behind. Now, what you're seeing there is me changing screwdriver. The first one was a little too large, a chance of scratching the top of the bridge, which is not what I want. Now, even though this is not the best of movements, um, genuinely not the best fit and finish I've ever seen, people put a lot of work into this. It, it's from a time period where people seem to care about the finished product, perhaps a little bit more than we do nowadays. This wasn't really designed to be chucked in the bin. So I like to give it the respect, or at least all the respect, my meager skills here are capable of. So get the bridges settled and down, and then we can run a test on the wheels here, just to make sure they all spin nice and freely. Not the freest I've ever felt, but again, this is not the best movement I've ever worked on. So a little bit of oil before the crown wheel goes back in. Now this was awkward to get off, and it is indeed awkward to get back on. So I'm gonna use a pair of bent tweezers. Just give that a little push. The crown wheel will then be oiled or the uh, spacer ring here will be oiled so the crown wheel can sit back on the top. See the gears on the bottom of the crown wheel which will interface with the back side of the watch or the dial side of the watch. A little bit of schmutz on this screw, not quite sure how I missed it but I'll get to cleaning it up and just screw this in. This is reverse threaded if you're wondering why I'm screwing it in the wrong way. And it's reverse threaded just to make sure it doesn't unscrew as the watch winds and unwinds. Now the spring will need to go in for the click. This can be a little awkward. I used to put a piece of plastic on the top of this. Um, I'm a little more confident nowadays, so I don't. But if you're starting out, I'd still recommend the plastic technique. Now this screw here is going to hold down the click, which allows that click to do its thing. Now I am going to end up taking that screw out. It's just a little too rusty. There's some gouges on the side, so I'd like to fix that. I'm going to fit the ratchet wheel here, which you can see in the facing with the click. And yeah, there's that screw. So there is a lot of cosmetic damage to this watch, but the rust on both the sides and the head of this screw were a little too much for me. So I'm going to pull out a screw polishing lathe, but I'm not actually going to use the entire tool. I'm just going to use this top bit here for work holding. Now, this is going to drive some of you, I am sure, a little bit mad. Feel free to shout at me in the comments, but I'm not going to use the whole lathe assembly for screw polishing here. I'm basically going to take a bit of 3000 grit sandpaper on a polishing stick and just give that head a little polish. Now the disadvantage to this is it will round over the bevel somewhat, but as I mentioned, there is a lot of cosmetic damage on this and I just want it a little bit better. I don't need this to be perfect. The time and trouble I would have to take to polish that bevel back in and get it absolutely perfect is not, in my opinion, worth it for this particular watch movement. So that goes in, that screws our click back down and it's looking a lot, lot, lot better than it was. But you can see the cosmetic damage all around this movement. It is actually very clean from the ultrasonic cleaner. It's just there is a lot of wear on this movement. It's old. The plating is worn. It probably wasn't the finest of fine quality when it was built. Uh, these were built after the war. Uh, you can see some machining marks on it and stuff. So it was never designed to be a high-end watch for the wealthy gent. It was more designed to go on the wrist of a working man so he could actually tell the time because, you know, in the day people didn't have phones to just pull out of the pocket. So the intermediate winding wheel goes on or the intermediate winding gear here. This will 
bridge the keyless sun motion works. The motion works are the cannon pinion, the hour wheel and the minute wheel, and that will bridge over to the keyless works, which will allow us to wind and set the watch. Now, I feel like I say this every video, but I think it's interesting for new people. So the keyless works is so called because it allows the winding of the watch, putting power in the watch and the setting of the watch without the use of an additional key. So back in the day, pocket watches would have one key to set the watch and one key to wind the watch, or just one key for both, but you would have to carry your pocket watch and a little key, extremely inconvenient. Um, so the keyless works uh, were kind of an innovation in watchmaking back in the day. So the winding pinion going in here, the sliding pinion will come in after it. Bit of grease on this grease anywhere there is heavy metal on metal contact. I will link down the oils and greases I use, basically all Mobius, pretty standard stuff in the watch industry. But I won't give a list and where I use them just for people that are interested in giving this a go. And I genuinely do encourage you to give it a go. It'll be a little bit expensive to get started and it can be extremely frustrating, but it's a very rewarding uh, hobby. It, it's great to bring these old watches back to life, especially ones like this that have such an interesting history to them. Definitely a talking piece in my book. So again, a little bit more grease. The spring, the yoke spring and the yoke went in there. Again, the yoke spring can be a bit of a pain. I used to use, as I said, a little bit of plastic over the top, but I've gotten a bit more confident. So that rebuilds our keyless works there, just getting this cover plate with a setting jumper on it. Now this can be a little awkward to fit. There is that spring underneath it. And if you are not careful, the whole thing can end up springing back up right into your face, sending the parts into the Swiss space program to join all of the other parts I have sent into orbit. At this point, I am fairly sure that NASA will be in touch soon to tell me to stop launching stuff. But anyway, here is the keyless works working. So you can see there that would adjust the time and this setting winds the watch. Now, everything is as smooth as butter. This was definitely not the best watch experience I've had, but we're not done yet. We will need to flip this watch over, remove the cap jewel from this side, fit the balance back. So it's a lengthy process, especially on a watch that doesn't have a shock setting, an ink block setting, a data shock or whatever shock setting they use. The balance will have to be disassembled. Now, cleaning these cap jewels, I'm going to use a bit of berge on B-dip. I just use a bit of pegwood to peg the jewel just to wipe off any stubborn dirt. And then a blower here just to agitate the water. I'm going to use another blower when it comes out to dry it off because you don't want to be putting your oil, obviously, on a wet surface. This would kind of defeat the purpose. And this is a bit of leather on a stick, which I just use to give that jewel the final polish. You want to mirror polish on it. So here is the oil. I use about half of the surface area of the jewel with oil or cover half of the surface area of the jewel with oil in the middle there. And then that cap jewel setting can go back on. Hopefully you don't drop that like I almost did and have to start again because you would if you drop that face down on something. Obviously you would remove the oil. The screws on this are tiny. This is, I believe, the screw I used in the scale video at the start. So these ones are really small. So the watch has been flipped back over so we can fit the pallet fork. Now, the pallet fork will need to be oiled. The exit pallet will need to be oiled. I don't think I show it on this video. I will try and get round to it. It's a very tricky thing to film. When the pallet bridge goes on, you need to make sure that the pallet fork pivot is coming through the top. You'll notice on this movement, there was no jewel on top of the pallet bridge. Cost saving measure, I would assume. Lack of materials, maybe given the time period. So once the pallet fork is in, I can actually wind power into the watch, which is what I'm doing now. And you'll see the pallet fork easily jump from one side to the other. Now I have to get the balance disassembled. And this way of moving this is, is terrible. I actually end up 
bending the pin here. You'll see it in the next shot. I think I left it in the video on purpose. And I know I bent the pin here. Here we go. I know I bent it because when I had to regulate this, I remember thinking, what idiot bent the pin? Well, it turns out it was me. But that way of moving the adjustment aside so you can pull the spring out is terrible. There would normally be a slot in the top so you can move it with a screwdriver or a hole through it so you can move it with a pin or an oiler. There was nothing on this. Again, I believe as a cost cutting measure, just makes it really, really awkward um, for the reason of cost, I would assume. Not something I liked working on. So the balance cock and the capsule there going into B-dip, again, the same process. The whole hairspring and balance wheel will go in together. There's no need at this point to remove the hairspring from the balance wheel. That would only need to be done if you needed to make adjustments to that hairspring, which fortunately in this case, we do not, because that is right. I'm going to be just brutally honest. Making adjustments to hairsprings is right at the level of my skill set and not something that I feel comfortable at the moment doing on video. Fortunately enough, this watch didn't need it. Same cleaning process for this cap jewel as the last one. And then you can see I've done the oiling off camera um, or I will do the oiling off camera, but you can see the mirror kind of finish on that cap jewel. And when I bring it in, you'll see it's got that dot of oil in the middle, like we did on the last one. And it's time to get this reassembled. Now, I don't actually notice the bent pin on this until I come to regulate the watch later. As I said, when it flashed through my mind, what idiot has been in here and bent this pin? Well, on watching the footage, said idiot was me. Uh, it happens, especially with this very awkward mechanism to close that spring in. So these little screws, Total pain, of course, uh, everything's a little wobbly. I'm going to bring in a bit of pegwood to hold it all still and get this screwed down. Now, this is not my favorite part of uh, the watchmaking process. Um, it's something that's very common to do. You have to get comfortable with it. I'm getting more comfortable with it as time goes on. But it's very easy to make a mistake in this process. Bend your hairspring and you're going to be tears before bedtime, really. Hairspring adjustment at that level, in my experience, is difficult and very tricky to master. So this is going back together. You have to make sure that the end loop of the spring goes through the pin and into the watch there. So I'm going to muck about with that until it goes in, which it does. I'm not going to make you sit through it. And you can see we're putting this back in. Now, this should tick. If we've done everything correctly, you should get a tick, which indeed we do. But I'm going to say right now, it looks off to me. Just by eye, not the wobble there, that's just me adjusting the balance cock. This will spin again, I believe, when I push the balance cock down. But the amplitude, something doesn't feel right with this. So I'm going to get it, rest of it oiled up and then I'm going to shove it on a time grapher, which is an instrument for measuring how accurate the watch might be or how much we have mucked it up uh, more to the point and just double check everything went right. So I'm going to oil the top jewels and the bottom jewels. Again, I'm not going to show it all because it's kind of similar and time constraints, basically. So here is the watch on a time grapher, which is missing. Don't worry, I have other footage. Uh, this watch had a very bad beat error to it, so it needs to be adjusted. Sorry about the missing footage, but I'd already fixed the watch by the time I found out it was missing. Now, I make a mistake there. I pull the hairspring down too much as I adjust the collet. Don't do that. Now, I did this several times. There were several beat error adjustments that needed to be done. You can get a better look at that process if you're really interested in the technicalities in my Gruen video, but it looks like I got away with pulling that hairspring down too much. It's still bad practice, so I'm still going to point it out. But we have a fairly decent rate, a great amplitude, and a beat error below one millisecond, so that's enough for me. This actually took four adjustments of the hairspring collet to get that beat error down into a reasonable level, but it worked out 
just fine. So this is probably beating as well now as it did from the factory, so that makes me quite happy. I'm just going to put the hour wheel on here. Now this will need a dial washer to stop it falling up and detaching the hour hand. Now when I disassembled the watch it didn't have one, so I'm just going to put a vintage one I had lying in the box on and I'm going to try and attempt to clean the dial. Now I do this with a microfiber kind of cotton bud thing. It's not happening though. Um, dial cleaning is an art form all to itself. There are many ways to do it. There are many ways to ruin your dial in my experience. So I go very, very gently and just try and clean the worst of the dust and grime off. A lot of this damage is actually through the layer of shellac. So it's actually permanent damage. You would need to have the dial professionally restored, resprayed, repainted. Um, and I think it looks quite good as it is. So putting the watch back together, you'll see the dial go back on in a minute. There is definitely some cosmetic damage, but if you look at it from the distance you would look at it from in real life instead of under a microscope like we are here, it actually looks fairly spot on. Now, the case could probably use replating, but the shape of the lugs make that extremely difficult without changing the shape of the watch. So I'm actually going to leave this one. Again, I'll refer you to my Gruen video where I do a full case replay and a full restoration. This one would be exceptionally complicated and under a microscope, once again, it doesn't look great, but by eye, it looks absolutely fine. And that's really what I look for in a vintage watch. Something that looks good from two feet away because that is the distance that you're going to be looking at it. Now this Seiko has gone back together really quite easily and really nicely. I'm going to use a press and various other tools to get it finally assembled. But I would love to know your guys' thoughts on Seiko. So I've never been a Seiko collector. I am thinking of buying a more modern Seiko. I actually went to try on a Grand Seiko. Lovely, lovely watch. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. What are your thoughts on this watch, on Seiko's early history? You know, it's all new to me with Seiko. So any thoughts you have on the brand, anything you noticed I might have got wrong with the history, obviously I was severely constrained by the amount of time I could spend on it. So there are bits missing. Um, there are There is definitely more to say. So if you are a Seiko collector, a huge Seiko fan, let me know your thoughts. Please, for everybody else, fill in any missing gaps that I might have left out. It would be greatly appreciated. And I genuinely enjoy the conversation with you all in the comments. I have learned uh, more from you guys than you have probably learned from me. So thank you for that. As this watch comes back together, I think it looks absolutely fantastic on the strap we made for it. I've put it on a deployment clasp. It just helps not damage that exotic skin. So a lot of work went into this one. It was a long video for me. I really hope you enjoyed the strap making. If you're still here with me, drop a subscribe on the video. Mrs. Saving Time thinks I'm somewhat ice skating uphill with this YouTube business. And I like to run around the house saying, I told you so. So I like a subscribe would be absolutely fantastic. And I thank you for it. Drop any comments you like. As I said, I do enjoy reading and conversing with people in the comments where I learn a lot that way. So this one came out brilliant in my opinion. It's a true piece of Seiko history. The strap suits the watch and the whole thing came together rather nicely. Beats like a champion and that's it from me. Thank you all very much for watching. I genuinely hope you enjoyed it.